Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 23. And the King James text today reads as follows. For the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. I'm going to talk today on a very controversial subject. In the evangelical world today, I have thought about this, meditated on it literally for years and never felt inspired of the Lord to preach a message concerning it until now. God and climate change. Amen. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus, lover of men's souls, embodiment of truth, Possessor and dispenser of all that is good and right and holy and just. We come before you, Lord, today. Master, the Word of God is so important. Without the properly divided Word of God being preached with power and authority through the Holy Ghost, it is but words that emanate from the lips of man and it is without power to change, to challenge, to inspire or to encourage. And Lord, today there is no human being on this planet who is more aware of the need for the Holy Ghost anointing when the Word of God goes forth than I. Lord, today, I humble myself in your presence. I ask God that you might use me as your oracle, that you might speak through me to the church of the living God today. Prepare the heart of every hearer. Soften our hearts. Till up the hard soil. Remove the rocks that would prevent the seed of this word from finding good ground and taking root that it might spring forth and bring fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. Anoint the speaker and the hearer both, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. 
In recent times, the issue of climate change has become a massive issue within the media. It's become a major issue within our government. It has become a political, politicized issue. And many Christians, this shocked me because to be honest with you, for many, many years I had no idea, honestly. I never in a million years thought that Christians would find a way to oppose the notion of climate change. It never even, never even crossed my mind that a Christian would have a problem with this issue. Never even, because... I know my Bible. And when the issue first arose, Tommy, the first thought that came to my mind was, well, <laughs> the Bible says that these things are going to come to pass. So I'm not even surprised. Right. But then as the years passed, all of a sudden I found out that there were a bunch of moronic Christians in the evangelical community who have allowed false prophets and false teachers to twist and pervert the Word of God in order to support the notion that climate change is not a genuine scientific issue. It is in fact this big conspiracy. When I first found out there were evangelical Christians touting this idiotic notion, I was shocked, utterly shocked. I, I, I cannot believe that. I just cannot believe that. That's the most ridiculous pile of foolishness I've ever heard in my life. In our primary text today, Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 23, the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that we are not, as Christians, we are not today what we're going to one day be. Right. When Jesus comes, when the church is redeemed, when the people of God are lifted up out of this world, and we are preparing in the heavens to enter in through the pearly gates of God's holy city, the Word of God said, we shall be changed, hallelujah, because in our present form, in our present nature, it is impossible for us to stand before God and to stand in His presence. But the Word of God tells us that one day our nature will change. We will be like Christ now is. And being as he now is, he's, he led the way. He set the pattern for believers so that what he's done, we can do. What he's become, we can become. One day we'll be in a position to look upon God and see God, the word of the Lord says, as he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we could not do that in our present state. So there has to be a transformation. There has to be a change. This mortal must put on immortality. And Paul refers to this promise. He said one day we're going to change. Hallelujah. One day things are going to be different. We're not going to struggle. We're not going to suffer. We're not going to go through the hardship that we go through now. Thank God. But then he goes a little bit further and he says, in fact, all of creation is going to change. Everything that God has created is going to change. He said right now as Christians, we moan, we groan within ourselves, we look forward to the day we can't wait until the Lord comes and we're no longer in this old flesh and blood body and we're no longer bound by pain we're no longer subject to death we're no longer going to have to 
shed a tear for a lost loved one. He said, but the same way that we groan within ourselves, waiting with hungry anticipation for the change that God has promised us. He said the entire world, all of creation, is equally groaning, is equally looking forward. He said because when we are changed, not only will we change, but everything in creation is going to change. Now, people read Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 23 all the time, and they do not see that this is what it's saying, but that is exactly what it is saying. In verse 21, because the creature itself, the term creature here in the Greek literally means all of creation. So instead of using the word creature, really, the King James translation could have simply said, creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So in other words, not only are God's people going to be changed, but all creation is going to be is going to be changed like God's people because like us as human beings creation is being worn out it's being destroyed it's being pillaged it's being raped it's being plundered Humanity is destroying our planet. And our planet, as it were, is looking forward to the day when it too will be changed, when it too will be delivered from its current bondage to the actions of man. Many people read John chapter 3, verse 16. And they fail to realize, for God so loved the world, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Greek word that is translated world here, listen, is the word cosmos. <laughs> Cosmos. Do I need to define that for the average person any further? Nope. Because you know what cosmos means. It means literally everything. Everything. God loved his creation. He loved it all so much that he gave his only begotten son. Because Jesus did not come merely for human beings to be saved, but so that the world could be saved. Because if man had his way, he would destroy it. Yes. And ultimately, what God has created, man would reduce to rubble. And therefore, God had to act not only to save mankind, but also to save all of creation. When we read in our primary text today, for we know that the whole creation, verse 22, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. Why would it be in pain unless something was being done to it that was hurtful or damaging? Travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, not only all of creation, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, or in other words, the redemption of our body. The word creature that is used in Romans chapter 8 
is the Greek word K-T-I-S-I-S. Literally meaning creation, the sum or aggregate of things created. So that literally is inclusive of all created things. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. In the original Hebrew, the word keep that is used here is the word shamar. To keep, to guard, to have charge of, to keep watch, protect, mm -hmm. preserve, reserve, Man was given dominion over, listen to me, according to the Word of God, man was given dominion over every living creature. Meaning, everything in the animal world, the Word of God said over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, okay, every living creature man was given dominion over. That's why, you know, we say man is at the top of the food chain. No matter how wild animals are, and no matter how, uh, you know, like a lion can certainly devour a man and destroy a man, but man has the ability to easily shoot down a lion long before the lion can get anywhere near him to harm him. We're at the top of the food chain, and that is the way God designed it. We are at the top of the food chain, not because of our physical design, not because of how we were created physically. We are not bigger, more powerful, stronger, better equipped. You know, we don't have longer claws. We don't have sharper teeth than the rest of the animal world. But what God gave us that allows us to be in dominion over all of animal kind is a mind. We have the ability to use our minds to create weapons, to create defenses. Therefore, we're at the top of the food chain, not because of our claws, not because of our strength, but because of our minds. God put Adam over the garden and he gave him the responsibility of protecting it keeping it, preserving it. Why? Because of his mind. Humanity has the ability to think. That is, if we don't allow some political party or some idiot politician to think for us, we have the ability to think. Yep. Therefore, we are able to do things, we know to do things, that help to protect, to defend, to preserve, and to keep this planet that God has placed us on. That's right. Just as he gave Adam the charge to do so, concerning the garden he placed him in. Uh-huh. Many Christians in our world today ignore the truth that humanity has been given the responsibility of caring for our planet. God gave us the planet to care for and to subdue. No other breed of animal has the intellect or ability to address matters of nature with such care and caution as are we human beings. We have the ability, for instance, to irrigate what would otherwise be dry lands, allowing for crops to grow where plant life would otherwise not even be possible. We have the knowledge necessary to rotate crops, thus allowing the land to rest for periods of time in order to avoid over-farming and thus wearing out the soil so that it no longer supports crops mm -hmm. which produce fruit. Mm -hmm. It is foolish to believe that man's running amok and doing things without any concern 
concern whatsoever for their effect on the planet and on our ecology is in keeping with Scripture. If you think that the greed of man which drives him to do whatever he wants, wherever he wants, however he wants, not given a flying fig about how it affects the ecology or how it affects our planet. If you think that's in keeping with Scripture and God's divine plan for the human race, you're an idiot. Can I say it any plain? We've got people that want to build a hotel and oh, they get mad because certain organizations come in and say, no, no, there's a there are certain types of animals there. There are certain types of plants there that are unique to that area and, and they must be protected. We've got to protect those things. And all the developers get so mad because all they want to do is build their hotel and make money. They don't give a flying fig about the effect it has on the local ecology. They don't care about the effects it has on plant life or on animal life. Because they have no fear of God, they have no thought whatsoever that God has placed us here as guardians and keepers of our environment. Mm -hmm. He never put us here to just run amok and act like a bunch of idiots and act like a bunch of fools. Not to care about other species, not to care about other breeds, not to care about other parts of God's creation. That is not how Christians ought to conduct themselves at all. That's right. But sadly they do. And what is the primary driver? Greed. Yep. The lust for wealth, the love of money. Man was given the intellect and the ability to approach all matters related to ecology with care. Yet in his greed, he has dumped poisons in rivers, mm -hmm. released toxins into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. bulldozed and destroyed millions of acres of life-supporting, oxygen-producing forests and foliage. Mm -hmm. Thousands of species of animal have been driven near or to the point of extinction because the planet's caregivers have allowed greed to propel their ventures without any thought at all for the well-being of our planet or its inhabitants, including its human inhabitants. Many hold a belief and an attitude that there are many animals which offer nothing to the overall well-being of our planet. Yet God created creatures, excuse me, God created these creatures for some reason. Destroying species after species as though they are worthless and useless is hardly in keeping with humanity's charge to care for our host planet. Many of these same people who hold such attitudes toward various now extinct species of animals also hold similar beliefs and attitudes toward many of their fellow human beings. Sure do. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people in our oh, well, you know, that particular species of bird, the world's not going to hurt that they're gone. It's not going to make any difference that this species of fish dies, or it's not going to make any difference that this particular species is now extinct because of man's encroaching upon their natural habitat. No, none of these things matter because after all, we're man, bless God. We can do whatever we want to do. But that is acting without any fear of God, that is acting without any knowledge of God, that is acting as though we are on this planet and we are God, not subject to God. Mm -hmm. See, but as children of God, we understand 
that even in terms of our environment, even in terms of our planet, we're caregivers. God has given this to us to care for to preserve, to defend, to take care of, hello now, not to pillage and to destroy. Oh, my Lord have mercy. Same people that believe certain species of animal, Tommy, are without any particular value, and therefore I can build my hotel, I can build my golf course, I can build my business venture in this area and yeah who cares that it's going to wipe this out or it's going to wipe that out listen as a Christian I understand and I believe with all my heart that God created the heavens and the earth I got news for you I don't believe for one minute that God created anything that does not serve some purpose in the overall scheme of things. Right. Just because I don't necessarily understand their particular purpose does not mean it does not serve a purpose. Right. And if I act as though my not knowing what purpose it serves is sufficient for my acting toward its annihilation, then I'm behaving as though I know as much or more than God. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. But see, many of these people who believe that there are animals and plant life in our world that have no value, there's no reason for them to exist. Let me do what I want to do. Let me make the money I want to make. I don't care about those things. Those things have no purpose. Many of these same people feel the same identical way about certain human beings. They sure do. People who are sick, people who are elderly, people who are disabled are viewed as being worthless. They give nothing to society. They offer nothing to humanity. Got news for you folks. The Nazis believed that the old, the sick, the infirmed, the mentally challenged, or the physically handicapped were an impediment to the human race and provided nothing of value. Yet, from a scriptural standpoint, the Word of God admonishes us to care for and to have compassion on these people. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. The Word of God tells us to care for the sick. It tells us to care for the infirm. It tells us to show compassion on those who are handicapped and those who have issues. Am I telling the truth? Yes, I am. If they exist for no other reason. They do so to allow us as the children of God the opportunity to employ our better angels and to demonstrate the attributes of spirit-filled living and godly love and compassion for our neighbor. If these people exist for no other reason, except for God's people to demonstrate attributes that they're supposed to demonstrate, then there is some purpose in their existing. True. Many who know history today understand the term Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl is defined as an area of the Great Plains of the United States that extended from southeastern Colorado, southwestern Kansas, the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles, as well as northeastern New Mexico. The Dust Bowl was a period of severe dust storms that greatly damaged the ecology and agriculture of the American and Canadian prairies during the 1930s. Severe drought and a failure, listen, and a failure to apply dry land farming methods to prevent the, uh, a, a, uh, <laughs> the wind erosion process mm -hmm. caused the phenomenon. Once the oceans of wheat which replaced 
the sea of prairie grass that anchored the topsoil into place dried up. Once the wheat dried up, the wheat that had been planted, mind you, in place of prairie grass, the land was defenseless against the winds that buffeted the plains. The biggest causes for the Dust Bowl were poverty that led to poor agricultural techniques, extremely high temperatures, long periods of drought and wind erosion. Some people also blame federal land policies as a contributing factor. Okay, now many natural disasters have nothing to do with man's activities or man's actions. There are disasters, however, which are strictly man-made. Mm -hmm. Those include major fires, yep. aviation disasters. Obviously, you know, they, a plane didn't just appear in the clouds, you know, out of the blue. Man created the plane, and when a plane falls and 200, 300 people die, that is a man-made disaster. Shipping and railway accidents, the release of toxic substances into the environment via ground contamination, airborne toxins, and poisoned natural waterways. These are all man-made. These are all disasters created by human beings, but we have Christians in our world today who scream and holler that it is not possible for climate change to be caused by human activity. Mm -hmm. Stupidity. Foolish. The same people who deny climate change are not so foolish as to deny the creation of the Dust Bowl by men who overfarmed the soil mm -hmm. and did not give the land sufficient rest or time to restore itself. Mm -hmm. Do you know in the Old Testament God commanded His people Israel, listen to me, every seventh year they were not to plant crops. Why? You know, I, I love people who, who try to dismiss the Bible as being this ancient document, you know. Oh, that's just a bunch of garbage written by ancient people. And, uh, let me tell you something, honey. The, the Word of God is so far ahead of its time, it'll blow your mind. When you look at what God commanded His people to do, and, and you look at some of the, even the dietary restrictions that He gave them, not to eat shellfish, not to eat uh, certain types of land animals and certain type of birds, you know, uh, it's funny because what he was doing was he was preventing them from eating any kind of animal that could potentially introduce toxins to their body. Because all the animals that God restricted man from eating, the, the people of Israel from eating, were scavengers. They were all animals that will eat virtually anything you put in front of them. Pigs. Goats for land animals. You look at shellfish. They eat anything uh, on the bottom of the ocean. They literally eat garbage and fish dung and you name it. That's what they exist on. Uh, 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 birds that prey on dead animals and garbage, you see. And the Lord said, I don't want you to eat none of that. Well, nowadays we look and we can realize, wow. It's really interesting that this book that was just made up by somebody, you know, this book that just, you know, somebody just sat down and wrote all this stupid crap down, and it really doesn't amount to nothing. Isn't it interesting that God literally taught His people thousands of years before it would become scientifically understood? Right. That the land must have time to rest. It has to have time to sit and do nothing. It has to replenish itself. 
nutrients and things must be reintroduced to the soil simply through natural process. Birds flying overhead and dropping their dung. Wild animals dropping their dung. You follow what I'm saying? Plants decaying. You leave a field without planting it for a year, and what are you going to find when you go back after a year? You're going to find thousands of plants. You're going to find that grass has grown, weeds have grown, all kinds of things have grown. But you know what? You need those things to have grown there. Because those things now, when you till that soil and when you break that soil up, all that now becomes nutrients for the soil. But if you just kept planting and kept planting and kept planting and kept planting and kept planting, you would literally wear the soil out. Now, human beings today, we use, we understand the idea of using uh, fertilizers and stuff like this, but the soil still, still, still needs time to rest, and farmers know that. That's why on large farms, they always have this field is being planted this year. Next year, I'll plant that field. And the following year, I'll plant that field. But they literally do not always plant the same field over and over and over again because they understand you can wear the land out. That's right. Folks, it isn't hard to understand that human beings most certainly can have a negative effect on our planet and on our climate in the process. In Isaiah 51 and verse 6, the Word of God said, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look to the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke. Listen. And the earth shall wax old like a garment. And they that dwell in there uh, that dwell therein shall die in like manner. But my salvation shall be forever, and my righteousness shall not be abolished. So God literally says, look at the heavens, look at the earth. He said, these things are going to disappear. These things one day will be gone. These things one day aren't going to be here anymore. He said, the earth's going to get old. It's going to wear out like a garment. It's going to wear out like a garment. It's going to wear out like a garment. Good God, people. If you've got a piece of clothing you love, and you don't want it to wear out, you take care of it. You keep it clean. Mm -hmm. You keep it pressed. You keep it hanging up in your closet. Because you know, if you just keep using it day after day after day after day after day, and you never wash it, you never clean it, you never take care of it, that it's going to wind up developing holes, the fabric is going to wear out, and it's no longer going to serve you any good purpose. Children of God understand the same thing is true of our planet. Mm -hmm. You can't just use it and 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 not expect that you're not wearing it out. My goodness. Even the Word of God tells us this. In Matthew 24, verses 21 through 25, as, as well as verse 35, Jesus said concerning the end times, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. Now listen to this next phrase. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh... That refers to all animal kind, everything that is animal, not just humanity, but animal. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. If man has his way, 
the Word of God says, if things were allowed to play out without God's ultimately intervening, there is not a single living thing that would survive. That is what I just read to you. The things that are going to transpire during the tribulation would literally, ultimately result in nothing living in the way of flesh and blood remaining alive. Fish, animal, you know, human, none of it. Let's go on. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall grow, show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The Lord said, Behold, I have told you before, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. All of creation is waiting for a change. There has to be a change. We're not, as Christians, we're not alone in our anticipation of glorification. We're not alone in our anticipation of redemption. No, the entire planet looks forward to the day. Scientists have predicted that the long-term effects of climate change, listen, will include a decrease in sea ice and an increase in permafrost thawing, an increase in heat waves, and in heavy precipitation, as well as decreased water resources in semi-arid regions, meaning areas that are already pretty dry, that don't have a whole lot of water, the water resources they have are going to dry up. Oh, but man can't do that. That doesn't have anything to do with man. Revelation 16, excuse me, Isaiah 24 verses 5 and 6, the earth also is defiled mm -hmm. under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws, the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Shall I repeat that for you? The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Why? Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. We have not done things the way God would have it done. We have not approached things the way we ought to approach things. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth and they that dwell therein are desolate therefore the inhabitants of the earth are listen burned and few men left more frequent and intense drought storms heat waves rising sea levels melting glaciers and warming oceans can directly harm animals destroying the places where they live it can wreak havoc on people's livelihoods as well as on communities as climate change worsens they predict dangerous weather events will become more frequent and more severe I don't see a problem with one word that I've just read to you I've known the Bible since I was a kid the Word of God said every one of these things is going to happen I don't see a problem with it you know what the problem is we've got a bunch of idiots to call themselves Christians 
who when they read the Bible, and the Bible has a prophecy that such and such is going to happen, they immediately add to what they've read, like I said earlier, a fact that is not in evidence. In other words, they add an aspect to that that the Word of God does not say. Well, no, that's not because man's actions, these things are going to happen. That's going to happen because God's going to make those things happen. That's not what the Bible says. Nope. Mm -hmm. All we are reading is, in the last days, these things will transpire. Right. Don't read into it that God is going to make these things transpire. No, 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 no. God knew thousands of years ago that humanity was going to rape and pillage the planet so that by the time we got to this point in history, these things would be happening. Mm. All he's doing is predicting, telling us in advance what is going to happen. has nothing to do, don't you read into it, that God's going to do these things. That is not what the scripture says. You'd be surprised how many Christians approach reading scripture in that way. They add things to it that are not in evidence according to the word of God. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, and the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. This is during the tribulation. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. In Luke chapter 21 verses 7 through 11 and they asked him saying Master but when shall these things be and what sign shall there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said take heed that Ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. He said, in other words, he said, the end at this point is still not on top of you. Then said he unto them, verse number 10, Luke 21. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise up, arise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom.
and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places and famines and pestilences and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. He didn't say God was going to make famines. He didn't say God was going to cause the earthquakes. He didn't say God was going to cause the pestilences. He said they would be. So he's simply predicting what he knew was going to transpire. Uh -huh. Climate change affects the social and environmental determinants of health, clean air, safe drinking water, sufficient food, and secure shelter. Between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately one quarter million additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. Folks, much of biblical prophecy is not so much about actions taken divinely by God, but rather it speaks of the Lord's foreknowledge of events which are to come to pass. In other words, many of the prophecies we read speak of things which the Lord knows are going to come and not of things which the Lord specifically, personally, is going to do. He knows that man will so affect the ecology and climate that famines will become far more commonplace and not that he is going to visit famines upon the earth. The Lord knew that humanity would so exploit and destroy our planet that a number of things would occur in direct correlation to that looting of our natural resources namely earthquakes, floods, famine, etc. There have been earthquakes which they have said directly correlates with certain types of oil drilling. Am I telling the truth? So when you remove enough, enough natural gas from a big old pocket in the earth, well, you leave a big old empty hole, there's no pressure there anymore. When the gas was in there, it was pressurized. Now when you remove the pressure, all of a sudden the earth starts moving because there's no pressure there anymore. How hard is it to understand, folks? Not. That as human beings, our conduct and our behavior affects our planet. It affects our ecology. It affects our climate. Most scholars and theologians today acknowledge that man's bringing modern irrigation and farming techniques to the wastelands of Israel is in fulfillment of the prophetic, prophetic words we read in Ezekiel 36, 8 through 12. But ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. Talking about Israel once again being a nation, you know, being brought back together as it was in 48. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you, and ye shall be tilled and sown, and I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. In other words, people are going to gather. They're going to come into Israel. The, the nation's going to grow numerically. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited, and the wastes shall be builded. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates, and I will do better unto you than at your beginnings and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you. He's literally talking to the mountains of Israel. He's talking to the land. Mm -hmm. 
God is, okay? He said, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of me. Now, another translation says this passage, Ezekiel 36, 8 through 12, like this. I'm almost done. Thus saith the Lord God, you, O mountains of Israel, shall yield your produce and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for their return is near, for I will care for you, I will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. I will settle a large population on you, the whole house of Israel. The town shall be resettled and the ruined sites rebuilt. I will multiply men and beasts upon you, and and they shall increase and be fertile and I will resettle you as you were formerly and will make you more prosperous than you were at first and you shall know that I am the Lord I will lead my people Israel to you and they shall possess you you shall be their heritage and you shall not again cause them to be bereaved in Isaiah 35 verse 1 listen to this prophecy the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, meaning the return of Israel, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Israel has developed some of the most amazing techniques for irrigation that you've ever seen. They have areas in Israel now that literally were virtually desert that now they are literally reaping harvests from because they have developed techniques whereby they are able to bring water to these regions. The desert shall rejoice and spring forth as a rose. Many theologians, many uh, Bible believers, many preachers will tell you that th this is what this passage is talking about. When Israel comes back, they're going to be able to do things and cause things to happen that they never were able to do before. And that it's going to be far greater than it ever was before. Didn't say God was going to cause springs to suddenly break out in the middle of the wilderness. No, it's not what it said. Do you follow what I'm saying? So you've got to be careful about adding to something and trying to make it say something it does not say. I'm at the end of my message. The bottom line is this. In his lust for wealth and power, man's greed has raped and pillaged our planet. We have offended the Lord in that we have chosen to ignore our mandate to be caretakers and guardians of our planet. We have chosen instead to behave as though nothing we do is of any consequence. When we human beings have the ability to do good and to cause good things to transpire, where once the land was lifeless, and barren even so we are equally as capable of bringing destruction and havoc to what was otherwise a good land failing to recognize that humanity and his actions can infect can indeed contribute to negative events within our environment and our climate is to spit in the face of God. Folks, we've got to repent and approach our responsibilities with care and caution. Or else we will most assuredly reap what we have sown and there will be none remaining to rescue or save. I close my message today with this, 2 Chronicles 7:14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Who is committing wicked actions? People who are called by the name of the Lord. He said, you need to repent, you need to pray, you need to seek my face, you need to turn from your wicked ways. 
Listen to what he said. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. Listen. And will heal their land. Only land that needs to be healed is land that's been destroyed. That's right. Land that's been harmed. Mm -hmm. Folks, we have more cars on the road today than ever in the history of the world. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that with all the carbon monoxide we're putting out, as the years have progressed, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that if man was not creating automobiles, and if man was not drilling for oil and operating these automobiles, all of this carbon monoxide would not be released into our atmosphere. It would not exist. So Christian, how stupid can you be to stand there and tell me that man has free reign in the earth. He can do whatever he wants to do, however he wants to do it. Bless God, the Bible says so. Baloney. How can you not understand that man's involvement on this planet has had an impact and a negative role in the ecology, in our air, in our water, in our land. How can you not understand that when there are billions of people around the world driving around in automobiles that are putting out thousands of cubic feet of poisonous gas, how can you not understand that this would have a negative impact on our climate, that this could indeed do exactly what scientists are saying that it's doing? How can you read the Word of God and see that Scripture tells us that famine and floods and disasters and heat and intense heat are coming the closer we get to the end of this thing? How can you not understand that God never said He was going to do these things. He simply said these things were going to occur. How can you not understand? The Word of God told us all about what we now understand to be the effects of climate change. How can you not understand that? Why does the church, why do Christians have to look like a bunch of moronic idiots in the world opposing science arguing with scientists on this issue now listen you're talking to, you're looking at somebody I'm a child of God I believe the Bible I believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth I don't believe in evolution I'll be honest with you I'm not going to argue with a scientist if they want to believe evolution is how it all started then God bless them I could care less I don't believe in it and I have all kinds of scientific arguments for why I don't believe in evolution. But you know, but I pick my fights. When science is right, they're right. right. Nowhere in the Word of God does it explicitly say anything that would contradict the notion of climate change. Nowhere. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. And if you think there is, you, you, you are so diluted and you're taking things so out of context and twisting and perverting Scripture. We've got preachers in our world today, folks, who go out of their way to placate the most lustful, wicked, greedy, men on our planet. Christians, preachers, who go out of their way. When is the last time you ever heard a sermon on greed? Oh no, they'll preach against the homosexual till the cows come home. But you never hear 
a television preacher talk about greed even though the word of God says it is the love of money that is the root of all evil not some evil not most evil all evil at the root of everything that is evil the bottom line is always going to come back to money without fail that's why they say follow the money you you want to you want to see what people been up to you want to know what kind of evil deeds they've been doing follow the money because that's where it always comes back to i'm here to tell you today folks greed is destroying our nation greed is destroying the church greed is destroying our planet and greed is the cause of climate change and greed has no place in the life of God's people I've tried to share with you today a simple word the Lord gave me concerning God and climate change. Would you stand with me this afternoon?